Hello, hello all. My name is Artyom Sace and I'm moderating today's event. The founding of the United Nations in 1945 was a watershed, not least for ushering in the human rights revolution, ostensibly meant to shape the new international order following the horrors of the Second World War. Ostensibly, because despite the lofty intentions of its founders, human rights continue to be honored more in their breach than in their observance in many places in the world today. Palestine, of course, stands out as the perennial case in point. And here to discuss these issues with us today are three giants of the struggle for human rights in Palestine. John Dugard is Professor Emeritus of International Law at Leiden University, a renowned legal academic who pioneered the human rights movement in South Africa, John founded the Center for Applied Legal Studies at the University of Witzwatersrand, where he did pathbreaking work in advocacy and litigation in support of human rights during the apartheid years. A former director of the Ladder Pact Center for International Law at Cambridge, John has served as a member of the International Law Commission and a judge ad hoc of the International Court of Justice. Richard Falk is Albert G. Milbrank Professor Emeritus of International Law and Practice, Princeton University, and Visiting Distinguished Professor of Global Studies, University of California at Santa Barbara. A prolific scholar activist, Richard has authored, co-authored, or edited over 30 books and numerous essays covering subjects as broad as one can think of, including nuclear proliferation and disarmament, American imperialism, the Vietnam War, world government, use of force, the responsibility to protect, and ecocide. Since 2009, he's been nominated annually for the Nobel Peace Prize. Michael Link is Associate Professor and former Associate Dean of Law at Western University. He teaches, researches, and writes in labor, international human rights, disability, constitutional, and administrative law. Among his many writings, his work on Palestine has appeared in a co-edited volume international law in the Middle East conflict, and other venues such as the Max Planck Encyclopedia of Public International Law, the Netherlands Quarterly of Human Rights, and the Journal of Palestine Studies. What brings these three remarkable individuals together today is the fact that each of them has held the post of the United Nations Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in the Palestinian territories occupied by Israel since 1967. John, from 2001 to 2008, Richard from 2008 to 2014, and Michael from 2016 to 2022. And much to our great delight, they have recently collaborated to produce a co-authored book about their experiences in that role, which we have the distinct pleasure to be launching today. The book is entitled Protecting Human Rights in Occupied Palestine, Working Through the United Nations. All proceeds of this book will go to Playgrounds for Palestine, and the book is available at your local um, bookstores and online. We've been given an hour and 15 minutes for this panel, and I should like to invite Richard by kicking things off by taking three to four minutes to discuss the origins and purpose of the book. I will then ask each of the special rapporteurs to spend six minutes or so to discuss the principal issues addressed by each of them in their reports, and then that will be followed by an opportunity again for each of the special rapporteurs to uh, address some of their challenges that they faced in discharging their mandates. Um, we're taking questions and I will then open the floor up to questions uh, from the audience. I may have uh, uh, one or two questions myself, but without further ado, I I'd like to pass it over to you, Richard. Uh, thanks very much, Hardy. And I want to thank uh, the Institute of Palestine Studies for convening this book launch and uh, accommodating us by uh, allowing the, us to uh, present uh, this uh, completed project uh, uh, to those who are in attendance. The idea of a, pulling together a book uh, by three more or less successive uh, special rapporteurs is somewhat original in the context of the uh, UN treatment of what it called special procedures. And as far as I know, has, had never been done before. 
But the motivation for doing this was that we uh, knew each other and uh, had a uh, friendship and uh, congeniality of perspective on uh, the issues that were presented by uh, Israel's occupation of Palestinian territory, and that this dynamic of uh, Israel's occupation and the re reporting on its violations of international law had evolved over this more or less 20-year period in ways that were somewhat illuminating beyond the three segments of our separate uh, uh, roles as observers. And I think one needs to understand that it was not only uh, our role, but Israel tried to adapt to uh, what they apparently found as damaging uh, criticism of their occupation by changing their own tactics in addressing uh, critical commentary of the sort uh, that we brought to bear. And so we tried to get around their efforts at um, restricting uh, access and obscuring the transparency of the occupation. And they, in turn, tried to make it more difficult uh, to report and have it and have the reporting address uh, addressed in a substantive manner their efforts were designed more increasingly uh, to shift the conversation away from the substance and to the process so it was a kind of arms race uh, of sorts that uh, is still going on with the current uh, special rapporteur. So I think the book tries to summarize both the substance and the process, and I feel that it accomplished uh, what we had in mind when we set out on this journey. Let me stop there. <clears throat> Lovely. Thank you so very much, Richard. That's a great introduction. Um, I'd like now to open it up to, to, to all three of you, perhaps starting with John, uh, to discuss some of the principal issues that you wrote, that you that you raised in your reports as special rapporteur. John, thank you, Audie. Uh, at the outset, let me say that uh, my mandate was very different from the mandate of Richard and Michael in that I was permitted by the Israeli government to uh, carry out my task a special rapporteur in the uh, occupied Palestinian territory, uh, that is West Bank, East Jerusalem and Gaza. And during those visits, I recall meeting Adi and being shown around Adi, who was then working for UNRWA. Uh, so I was able to uh, see the situation on the ground, so to speak, and my reports, I think, reflect this. Uh, I want to refer to three issues which I addressed as Special Rapporteur in particular. First of all, the, there was a question of the war. It was during my mandate that the uh, Israeli government commenced the construction of the so-called security wall. Uh, when I saw the wall, I warned immediately this was not a security wall, that it was a wall designed to annex territory belonging to the state of Palestine. Indeed, it annexes some 10% of Palestinian territory. And I warned of the uh, serious consequences that flowed from this uh, act of annexation. And I was instrumental in uh, persuading the uh, Palestinian uh, Authority and ultimately the General Assembly to request an advisory opinion which uh, has played an important role in, in the whole uh, debate. Uh, the second issue that was important was that of uh, Gaza. I was in uh, 
the occupied Palestinian territory during the Second Intifada, and I witnessed the uh, attacks on Gaza and the atrocities committed there. The third issue, which I wish to refer to greater length, is that of uh, apartheid. Uh, I first visited uh, Israel-Palestine in 1982, and I was immediately struck by the similarities between apartheid South Africa, with which I was familiar, and uh, the situation uh, in Palestine. Uh, as Special Rapporteur, I failed to address the subject frontally, uh, really almost until the end, because I realized that to mention the fact or to argue that uh, Israel applied apartheid would affect my credibility, particularly amongst Western nations. I don't refer to the fact that uh, many of the features of uh, Israel's policies resemble those of apartheid South Africa, particularly the restrictions on freedom of movement and the forcible removal of populations. But it was only in 2007 that I said that, in my opinion, the uh, situation in uh, the occupied Palestinian territory was uh, a form of apartheid. And uh, I did not say so then, but I say so now that, uh, in my view, many of the features of the apartheid uh, situation in uh, the occupied Palestinian territory are worse than they uh, were in uh, apartheid uh, uh, South Africa. Uh, apartheid is a form of institutionalized racial discrimination, which uh, uh, takes the form of discrimination and repression. Uh, certainly the uh, Israeli system is discriminatory, but it is probably, I think certainly worse uh, than the South African system when it comes to uh, repression. Uh, the Israelis have uh, killed more civilians in the course of their operations than the South African authorities did during the apartheid era. They've destroyed more houses. And uh, I think one of the unfortunate features of the situation, which is not mentioned sufficiently, is that Israel is obliged in terms of the Fourth Geneva Convention to uh, provide for the welfare of the local population. And uh, during the apartheid years in South Africa, the South African apartheid regime did establish separate uh, schools, universities, hospitals, clinics, industrial areas for blacks. On the other hand, Israel has done nothing to promote the welfare of the population of Palestine. It has left this entirely to the international donor community. In so doing, it has violated the Fourth Geneva Convention, but it has also uh, indicated that its form of apartheid is worse than that practiced by South Africa. Let, let me end there. I'm sure other speakers will get back to the subject of apartheid. Richard, back to you. Thank you so much, John. Uh, let me say at the outset that uh, John did his job so well that it prevented uh, our access uh, to the territory, to the occupied territory. In other words, in this interaction between the UN and Israel, Israel learned from the devastating character of John's report that it was better to keep the special rapporteurs out than to allow them in, and that that might uh, weaken uh, the hope, I presume, was that it might weaken the impact of these reports. And so it was up to uh, Michael and myself to figure out ways to be effective given uh, our exclusion from the experience of those who were living under uh, a, uh, living under this apartheid form of occupation. And 
that was definitely a limitation uh, that one shouldn't uh, uh, underestimate. Uh, what one of the things that I did to uh, circumvent that uh, limitation was to more liberally interpret my mandate. And in that role, one of the one of the more controversial things I did was to include the refugee communities in uh, Jordan and Lebanon as part of what uh, I was reporting upon and had very meaningful meetings in both those countries in the course of uh, carrying out the mandate. And in a way, this was uh, I think quite uh, damaging to Israel because it brought into the uh, agenda of violations their failure to uphold international law with respect to the several million uh, Palestinian refugees who had been living not under occupation by and large, though many were within the occupied territories, uh, but were living in neighboring countries under conditions that resembled or were in some instances worse and more dangerous than the occupation itself. So the notion of not including the refugees in the mandate as it was originally framed was in a way a a, a conservative move by the Human Rights Council, I guess, to, not to agitate uh, further pro-Israeli uh, forces that have always been very powerful within uh, the UN itself. Uh, in addition to the issues that uh, John addressed, and I also tried to uh, cover them because, uh, as with everything bearing on uh, the situation of the Palestinians and the character of the Israeli occupation, it doesn't stay static. It evolves over time, and therefore, it what was most relevant in the period of 2001 to 2008 uh, had a somewhat uh, different quality in the period 2008 to 2014. I would add to what he addressed uh, the issue of the settlements that were clearly in violation, Israeli settlements in the West Bank and uh, East Jerusalem were clearly in violation of Article 9 uh, Article 49 of the uh, Fourth Geneva Convention on Belligerent Occupation. And they were uh, also signals to the Palestinians and to the world and to those uh, diplomats that were in Israel that the uh, supposed Israeli commitment to a diplomatic negotiated peace was somewhat at best ambiguous. I think that the settlements created a atmosphere of uh, doubt about whether diplomacy could, uh, in a sense, disrupt the completion of the Zionist project to have full control over the entire promised land, which amounted to uh, all of the all of Palestine as it had been uh, uh, delimited during the period of the British Mandate and Ottoman rule. So this and and this dynamic was also evident in uh, developments in Jerusalem where uh, Israel uh, took a variety of measures to 
uh, undermine the secure the residential security of Palestinians in a dynamic that was intended to Judah Judaize all of Jerusalem and make the incorporation of the city, which was unlawful and has been condemned by the UN General Assembly, as um, uh, as uh, somewhat of a fait accompli that could not be easily reversed because of its altered uh, ethnic quality. And, and so this involved, in a sense, uh, a further phase of the Nakba, or the original dispossession of Palestinians uh, back in 1948, and uh, has a continuing character uh, that Palestinians uh, are quick to point out that the Nakba, or the catastrophe of dispossession, was not an event, but a process, and a process that persists at, at, at present. Uh, and there are many other developments um, that have been uh, damaging to Palestinian prospects for a political compromise and a peaceful outcome including the results of the most recent Israeli elections, which show, I think, uh, more than earlier, the vital importance of uh, reporting on the actual uh, practices and policies of apartheid Israel uh, that are applied to the Palestinians. Uh, and uh, this process is especially important for civil society, for the for the for those people that have a concern with international law and are not as intimidated by geopolitics as the permanent members of the Security Council are within uh, the UN. Let me stop uh, there. Thank you so very much, Richard. Over to you, Michael. Um, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> in, in my time, I, I want to highlight three themes that some of my reports um, between uh, 2016 and 2022 want of addressing. The first thing I want to address, which I, I think is, is right at the heart of why this uh, occupation continues uh, to fester, um, is the issue of accountability. And I actually addressed the issue of accountability and legal responsibility of, of uh, third states uh, in three of my 12 reports um, in 2019, 2020, and 2021. And I think this is so central because the UN has been, uh, has been paralyzed in its uh, efforts to try to resolve what it, it does accept as a permanent responsibility to ensure that there is a just and durable solution to the question of Palestine, knowing that the, if you like, the birth certificate for Israel was created in 1947 and 1948. Um, and in his memoirs, Kofi Annan, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, you know, said that um, the, uh, the, la the inability of the UN to be able to resolve uh, the question of Israel and uh, now, the question of Palestine remains a deep internal wound as old as the organization itself. And he said, this has been a, a festering sore constantly felt in almost every intergovernmental organ and secretariat body. So that, in, in effect, shaped my work and it certainly shaped uh, the work of John and Richard before me. Whenever we walk through the halls of, uh, of the United Nations in New York and Geneva or anywhere else that we had contact with, uh, with the UN. The second issue that was a, a focus of one of my reports uh, in 2000, I believe 2017, was on the whether or not the Israeli occupation is still lawful. And this is a question that has really not been grappled in any great depth by international uh, law. 
uh, I reviewed what I what I found with respect to the writings on the legality of an extended prolonged occupation, and particularly where an occupation was turning uh, was turning into annexation and was turning into apartheid. And I concluded that the occupation had become illegal. And one of the recommendations I had out of that report from 2017 was that the UN General Assembly should consider asking the International Court of Justice for an advisory opinion on this matter. And, and I'm gratified to say that I think my report played a small role in moving that issue to the General Assembly, which adopted a resolution asking for uh, an advisory opinion on this and several other related questions uh, at the end of December 2022. And this will probably be heard by the court sometime late in this year or early, uh, or early next year. And the third point I want to make is with respect to my reports goes to the question of what both John and Richard have talked about. Both John and Richard have done path-breaking work, and that's on the question of apartheid. I issued my 12th and final report to the Human Rights Council in March of 2022, and I examined the, the question of apartheid, and I, I concluded that Israel does meet uh, the definition of conducting apartheid, certainly in the occupied Palestinian territories. I, uh, you know, essentially, I, I concluded that how can you have um, two different laws, two different political systems working uh, working for the benefit the, uh, of of one uh, racial or, or ethnic uh, uh, group to the detriment of of another, um, ruled over by by a single uh, political entity that is Israel. Um, in the same in the same political space, the occupied Palestinian territories, and I found that this amounted to uh, to apartheid. And this was a uh, a report that I wasn't planning to write when I first became um, uh, rapporteur in 2016. I thought all I had to do was work within the bounds of international humanitarian law and international human rights law, and you know, obviously I would be able to persuade all the diplomats and the political decision makers who had an impact upon what went on in Israel and Palestine because of the force of the arguments of, of, of laws they, them, they themselves had agreed to. And I realized after the first five years in my mandate that they had an extraordinary ability to ignore what was happening on right in front of them, right in front of their eyes and their nose. And so this came to the conclusion that while I believe international humanitarian law, international human rights law does play an important role in analyzing uh, what is going on in the occupied Palestinian territories. The laws of occupation have now become inadequate politically and legally to understand what is going on. What is going on now is obviously full-blown apartheid, and we have to, I think, begin to understand this within the realm of settler colonialism, which is uh, what uh, our successor, Francesca Albanese, has uh, concluded in her first report as UN Special Rapporteur. So I'm, I'd like to think that each of us are, are see ourselves as building blocks uh, to be able to help the next Special Rapporteur on where in the direction where they're they're heading to this. But it's obvious that the change in the conversation, both in the regional and the international human rights community, with respect to analyzing this through the lens of apartheid, through the lens of settler colonialism, and uh, through the through the uh, lens of uh, of annexation. Um, is become uh, a significant focus of how human rights work is now done with respect to Israel and Palestine. And the last thing I'll say is just remember all those A words that keep on flashing up, you know, annexation, uh, apartheid, and accountability. Those are all central legal, political, and social issues when it comes to Israel and Palestine. And that's what I think John and Richard and I have immersed ourselves in over the past 20 years working on this issue. Wow, Michael, thank you very much for that. It, it appears very clearly uh, from, from the presentation by the three of you, how, how each one of you, as you mentioned, Michael, um, have conducted, a, if you like, a building blocks process, um, uh, building on the work of, of, of the person before, um, and hopefully moving forward uh, for the benefit of, of human rights in Palestine. Uh, I wonder if I might now uh, invite the three of you to discuss um, just touch on some of the challenges that you dealt with while you were uh, holders of, of the post. Um, uh, John, why don't we go to you? Yes, I had the uh, good fortune to meet the United Nations officers uh, in uh, the occupied Palestinian territory. And uh, at that stage, I was deeply impressed by the uh, way in which the UN approach the subject and the commitment 
of the uh, UN on the ground in Palestine to help the Palestinian people. But the situation was very different when uh, it came to Geneva and particularly New York. And uh, I think it's important to examine the uh, role of the United Nations in respect of, of Palestine. And uh, quite frankly, I found the uh, attitude of the Secretariat particularly disappointing. Uh, Kofi Annan was Secretary General during my uh, term, and uh, I was very impressed with uh, Kofi. He was clearly committed to uh, doing something on the Palestinian front, but uh, many of his high-ranking uh, officials uh, in the uh, Secretariat did not uh, share his view. For instance, it became clear to me that the uh, Secretariat had not supported the uh, advisory opinion. I was actually told that by one of the CD officials. And uh, later the assistant legal counsel of the uh, United Nations in effect killed the uh, advisory opinion by writing an opinion uh, in which uh, he took the position that the Secretary General was under no legal obligation to do anything about giving effect to the uh, advisory uh, opinion. There was also the failure of the uh, Secretariat to uh, take the issue of compensation for the construction of the war seriously. The International Court had uh, ordered that uh, compensation be paid to those who had been deprived of their property as a result of the construction of the war. It took many years for uh, the uh, United Nations under pressure from the General Assembly to uh, establish a procedure for obtaining compensation. And even today, no compensation has been paid. And I think this has just been uh, wiped off the agenda of the uh, United uh, Nations. Uh, the other thing that troubled me was the construction or the, the establishment of the quartet in 2004, the 2002, the quartet comprising the United Nations, the United States, the Russian Federation and the European Union is supposed to uh, direct uh, peacemaking and policy uh, in, in Palestine. But it became very clear from the outset that the United States called all the shots and the United States in effect vetoed any action taken by the quartet. For instance, it made it very clear that the uh, quartet should have no regard to the uh, advisory opinion and to implementing it. And I think it's been quite disgraceful the way in which the uh, Security Council has uh, allowed the United States to uh, in effect destroy the uh, uh, quartet. And I think the United Nations has behaved very badly in uh, associating itself with the quartet as of course has the European uh, uh, Union. So that, that really is something that uh, troubled me and I think needs further attention. But if we could turn to uh, today, I think one of the most important developments is the fact that uh, a number of important NGOs such as Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch have characterized the, uh, and Betzalem in Israel, have characterized the uh, occupation as the system of apartheid. It's very interesting that uh, the evidence is clear and I think most uh, members of the public accept that Israel does violate international law, it does practice a system that is tantamount to that of apartheid, but it's appalling the way in which political leaders fail to give effect to this characterization and in effect and in fact, oppose it vigorously. And uh, I think one has to address the uh, way in which this has been done. First of all, I think it's been done largely by the weaponization of anti-Semitism, which uh, has been used to suppress any serious criticism of Israel and any suggestion that it applies the system of apartheid. And I think it's distressing that attempts are made to uh, expand the uh, notion of anti-Semitism 
and to uh, enforce it and to suppress uh, discussion of the issue uh, in this uh, uh, respect. So I think that we need to address this issue. Let me conclude by saying that, in my view, the uh, issue of uh, the occupation, practice of apartheid in the occupied Palestinian territory, the violation of human rights and humanitarian law uh, in the occupied Palestinian territory poses a real test for the international community and particularly the European Union and the West, which have always indicated a commitment to human rights. And if they fail to promote human rights and to enforce respect for human rights in Palestine and to end the occupation, they will have undermined the whole human rights uh, endeavor. So this is a testing time for the West in respect of uh, the promotion of human rights and uh, its attitude towards uh, Palestine. Let me end there. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. There's a, a great deal there to, to dig into. Uh, but before we do, uh, over to you, Richard, for a bit on challenges that you faced while you were Special Rapporteur. Uh, well, I alluded to the uh, challenge that I faced by having to report from outside the territory and being denied the benefits of access to uh, Palestinians on the ground and actually to the UN personnel that was stationed there, although I had the opportunity to meet with some of them in either Cairo or uh, Amman, Jordan. Uh, I think that um, it's important in evaluating the UN in relation to this issue uh, to understand that the UN was designed to be weak when it came to challenging the strategic interests of the veto powers. Uh, there's no other uh, rationale for giving the most dangerous countries in the world uh, a unrestricted veto power with respect to their own obligations to uphold the charter. And uh, I think without understanding this primacy of geopolitics within the framework of the UN, uh, one fails to come to grips with the difficult uh, political obstacles to uh, holding uh, Israel to account. And in a way, this applies both to what uh, John just said and what uh, Michael earlier said with respect to the importance of accountability because these countries were never meant to be accountable. So it would require a uh, reform of the whole structure and mentality of the UN to think that they could be held accountable. And so the uh, to me, the value of the mandate uh, has been its uh, impact on legitimating Palestinian grievances and mobilizing global solidarity initiatives supportive of the Palestinian struggle. Uh, and as John just pointed out, the uh, apartheid discourse, which has been so uh, conclusively uh, addressed by uh, re the most respected mainstream human rights organization, being greeted by silence, not only by relevant governments, but by uh, the mainstream uh, media platforms in the world. If anything like this kind of consensus were to have emerged with respect to uh, Xinjiang province, let's say, in China, it, it, there would be an entirely different approach in the 
uh, public sphere and in the intergovernmental uh, context of within which the UN functions. So one has to understand the limitations of the UN. At the same time, it is in, in what I call the symbolic domain of politics, where issues of legitimacy and legality and morality are shaped. The UN, despite geopolitics, plays a decisive role. And it does give the uh, advisory opinion of the ICJ, while they might be ignored by the relevant government, they have a real uh, pedagogical and political impact on global activism and global solidarity. And if we remember, the apartheid was partly brought to an end not by intergovernmental action, though it was more important than in the Israel-Palestine context, uh, but by uh, global solidarity uh, efforts, including a BDS, a very robust BDS uh, uh, movement. And uh, that the, po the possibilities of that being the core of a Palestinian liberation strategy should not be overlooked in this present context. And in my judgment, again, Israel hasn't overlooked it. And part of the reason for weaponizing uh, anti-Semitism is to avoid the South African narrative. And again, we should pay attention to what Israel does in response to the exposure of its uh, legal and moral wrongdoing uh, in order to understand adequately the situation. Let me stop there. Thank you very much, Richard. Appreciate that. Michael, challenges while you were in post? Sure. You know, um, I'm often asked uh, as a, uh, with respect to your question as to, you know, the role of the United Nations, and isn't it uh, simply, a, simply a, a litany of failures? And I always say this, because I, I think it's, it's important to have a, 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 a balanced understanding of what the UN can wind up doing. At its very best, you know, the UN has provided an indispensable form for the question of Palestine to be addressed and for the right of uh, Palestinian self-determination to be uh, endorsed and pursued. Um, I think you'll find in, in the hundreds of resolutions that have been adopted by the General Assembly, the Human Rights Council and the Security Council, you know, the, the highest aspirations of the human rights movement and of international law. You know, the General Assembly has said, as I, as I had mentioned before, that the United Nations bears a permanent responsibility for the question of Palestine until it's resolved in all of its aspects. And, you know, the UN has devoted meaningful resources on the ground in the OPT uh, with respect to um, uh, uh, providing services and uh, social development projects uh, on the ground, um, whether, whether it be the uh, International Labor Organization, uh, UNICEF, um, uh, UNRWA, or any of the other agencies that are active there. But, you know, in my experiences, and I think I'm echoing what John and Richard have said, uh, the UN is rarely at its best when it comes to the, uh, the question of Palestine. Far more often, it's been hobbled desperately uh, whenever it's attempted to act upon its many resolutions in trying to get Israel to stop its de jure and its uh, de facto annexation to end the occupation and to clear the path for, for Palestinian uh, self-determination. And I think at the heart of this has to be, we have to point the finger at the, uh, at the United States. Um, ben Ki-moon, uh, who succeeded Kofi Annan as uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, wrote after he retired, he wrote uh, in 2021, that political cover provided by success of US, US governments to Israel is partly to blame for this lack of, U, of UN account, uh, accountability uh, imposed upon Israel to end the occupation. And we see this what's happened over the last uh, 10 days or so. Israel announces almost two weeks ago that it's going to um, uh, legitimize uh, nine of its uh, settlement outposts and make them regular settlements. Of course, all settlements are illegal 
under international law, and indeed they amount to a war crime under the uh, 1998 uh, Rome Statute. And it also says it's going to build up to 10,000 uh, new settler units, housing units in the in the settlements. Um, at the Security Council, uh, Palestine asks uh, for action to be taken by the Security Council. The United Arab Emirates, which is one of the 10 non-permanent uh, members on the council this year, brings forth a, a fairly substantial draft resolution uh, to be voted on by the council, which repeats a lot of what the council has already said with respect to the fact that the settlements are a flagrant violation under uh, under international law, um, that um, they uh, the settlement uh, construction should end immediately and be uh, and be reversed, and the prior resolutions have also condemned uh, Israeli annexation. The United States steps in, even though I, from my best understanding that 12 of the 15 members were prepared to support the resolution and two others would have supported it. I think I'm going to point my fingers at Albania and the United Kingdom would have supported had the United States come on board. But the United States threatened to veto it um, and instead wound up negotiating a milquetoast presidential statement, which didn't make any mention at all with respect to the illegality of the Israeli settlements made no mention with respect to annexation. And indeed, the longest paragraph in this presidential statement was focused on Palestinian terror, but made no mention of the much greater impact of uh, violence by his, the Israeli military. So um, I guess all of the issues that John and Richard and I would have seen with respect to how uh, stymied the UN was, particularly at, at its highest international political forum, on acting on the many resolutions that, that the UN has adopted, by the actions of the United States, the U.S. willing to use its diplomatic muscle to be able to uh, try to stifle any meaningful accountability with respect to uh, to Israel. You know, the, the conclusion I draw is that, you know, for the past two decades, the United States is regularly and explicitly endorsed a two-state solution, but it also insists that there should be no consequences on Israel, Israeli practices that have made such an objective absolutely impossible. And this is, I think, the uh, the fight and the dilemma that all of us um, who uh, work on the question of Palestine have to wind up facing. We have to realize that when we go to the International Court of Justice and we seek more resolutions coming from uh, the Human Rights Council or the General Assembly, it's really to provide this kind of legitimization that Richard has talked about so that civil society can do the hard lifting to try to get um, their country, their nation states to be able to change their position meaningfully with respect to the question of Palestine, to hold Israel meaningfully accountable, um, and to um, and to finally bring a just and, uh, and durable solution to the to the 14 million uh, Arab uh, Palestinian Arabs and uh, Israeli Jews who live between the Mediterranean and the Jordan River. Michael, thank you very much for that. Um, I wonder now whether or not it's a good time to, to get into some questions. I see there are a number of questions from the audience. Before we get to those, I have a simple question for, for you and ask any of you to pick it up. Um, the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, the International Court of Justice, as Michael has mentioned, um, ha in uh, December of this past year, has put a question to the court uh, on the lawfulness of Israel's continued presence in the occupied Palestinian territory lawfulness or legality of the occupation. Michael, you'd mentioned in one of your reports in 2017 that the occupation has become illegal. Why does this matter? I imagine there are a lot of folks out there wondering why getting an opinion from the International Court of Justice declaring the occupation to be illegal would even matter, given the geopolitics and the primacy of geopolitics that Professor Falk has mentioned, and the lack of movement by certain third states and so on. Why does this matter? Anyone? Perhaps, perhaps we let could me, let, me, let me start with, let me, let me briefly start with this and then I'll, I'll invite uh, John and Richard if they want to add to my remarks. I think this is important. You know, I, I am the first to say that international law uh, is not going to, uh, in its, on its own, resolve and, and lead us all to a just solution uh, for the question of Palestine. But I do think it plays a, a, an incredibly important role in shaping the politics of this. Uh, you know, the fact that uh, the, the settlements have been declared illegal over and over again by the United Nations um, does play a role in trying to hamper the ability of Israel to keep on expanding 
uh, the settlements. Not much, but I, I think now we're beginning to see the momentum of a, of a snowball starting at the top of a mountain and starting to pick up more snow as it heads down there. So why does a would, would a positive um, uh, decision coming in the form of an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice wind up mattering? I say it matters because it adds to that, if you like, um, legitimacy that uh, Richard has talked about. If the occupation itself is declared by the highest court in the international system to be illegal. If the highest court in the international uh, legal system says that, uh, Palestine, that the Palestinian right of self-determination has been consistently thwarted by Israel uh, in its drive to, to annex the territory uh, designated for a Palestinian state, if it decides that you know, the uh, that Israel has committed um, a violation of international law by, by building and expanding the settlements, by annexing East Jerusalem. That makes it that much harder for the major players, Europe, particularly Europe and North, Amer and North America, in the global north, uh, to keep on um, supporting Israel in, in the way that it has. It slowed, it slowed some of that support down. Uh, it's made them a little more cautious, particularly in, in Europe. But I think a ruling with respect to the legality of uh, of the of the occupation would propose a major challenge to the uh, uh, to particularly the role that the United States plays in uh, in supporting Israel in uh, in virtually all of its practices to uh, to thwart uh, Palestinian rights. Thanks, Michael. John, Richard, any views on that on the ICJ matter and why it matters? Yeah, I endorsed everything that. Uh, Michael has said, I would just like to point out that uh, the 1971 advisory opinion on Namibia did play an important role in shaping the uh, policy of the United Nations towards uh, Namibia. And uh, I hope and like to think this would happen in this case as well. And I think it would also play an important role in uh, perhaps changing the attitude of uh, European Union states. At present, the European Union uh, member states blindly follow the United States, but where they face a conflict between uh, a decision of the International Court of Justice and the judgment of uh, the State Department of the United States, they, they might be prepared to change their view. Uh, I would just add a somewhat more skeptical uh, view of the impact of an advisory opinion favorable to the uh, Palestinian struggle, and that is that unless it is accompanied by uh, much more uh, intense and effective pressure from below, I don't see any prospect, any reasonable prospect of a shift in the geopolitical posture of the United States or derivatively of Europe. It is true that that posture is being challenged by the extremity of the current Israeli government. And so maybe uh, looking at it most optimistically, an advisory opinion in this context would provide the kind of political uh, atmosphere that would allow a more balanced, more constructive view of uh, in the relevance of international law uh, to be uh, favored by Washington. Uh, but and, and there is a cost outside of Israel-Palestine for maintaining this silence about Israel's flagrant violations of international law. And that is, it weakens the invocation of international law for other issues, as in Ukraine, uh, as, in, uh, as with respect to China, because it makes the double standard so uh, vividly present as to make the invocation of international law in one context uh, so seem so hypocritical if it isn't extended to this context where the US has a much 
more direct and organic responsibility. Uh, thank you very much for that, Richard. I, I wonder if I might um, now uh, just try and give uh, some attention to some of the questions that we've received from the audience. I see there's a couple of questions we've received that relate to the apartheid matter. Um, one question is by, by a number of folks, uh, whether or not it might be useful uh, for uh, an attempt to be made to reopen the special committee, the United Nations Special Committee against apartheid in view of the coalescing view that Israel's engaged in apartheid against the Palestinian people. Anyone? John, perhaps? Yes, well, I think it would be a good move, but I, I'm not sure that it will would uh, have a, a major impact on the... Uh, decision makers uh, in the West, and, and that's my concern. I think that uh, an advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice is more likely to have an impact on uh, these decision makers. Richard, Michael, on the special committee against apartheid and reviving it uh, as a possible mechanism? I agree with uh, what John just said, and the only thing I would point to is the, uh, that it would have very little uh, probable impact on civil society activism, whereas the advisory opinion would have a big impact. I, I, I fully agree with what, what, what both what uh, John and Richard have said. I have called for the uh, reconstituting of the uh, UN Committee Against the Part on Apartheid uh, with respect to the question of Palestine. And I do think it's it's a worthy project to pursue. Um, I'm not sure it's gonna make a huge, it would make a huge difference, but it would keep the question uh, of, uh, of apartheid in the OPT and quite possibly apartheid between the river and the sea uh, alive and on the current UN agenda. So that, to that extent, I think it would be a good idea, but it wouldn't be where I, I think uh, it's going to move the needle a huge amount. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the issues that Richard had raised uh, in, his, in the first round of discussion was his discussion in his reports uh, of the Palestinian refugees uh, in Lebanon and elsewhere. Um, and that gives rise to the concern of, of some that have been articulated in these questions about the geographical limitations of the mandate, the, the, the limitations of the scope of the mandate fixed on 1967 territories, um, relinquishing, if you like, or not paying sufficient attention to the core of the Palestine question, which emanates from 1947 and the General Assembly's decisions of 1947 and the Nakba and so on. To what extent do you think <clears throat> creative readings uh, if you like understandings, interpretations of the mandate holder of this mandate can allow for um, going beyond merely the 67 territory um, and even beyond that which uh, you have done in your work, Richard. And why in the end does that matter, if at all? Uh, well, if the purpose is to communicate to uh, civil society, as I believe the major uh, impact of these reports, and to individuals in scattered important governments around the world, uh, I think it's uh, helpful to enlarge the scope of what it is at the core of Palestinian grievances and suffering over this long, intolerable period without any uh, plausible uh, horizon of uh, some kind of liberation. So that uh, I feel it's uh, really important to, uh, to get at the uh, pr proper scope, and the UN has moved in that direction, at least the Human Rights Council, by the establishment of this Commission of Inquiry recently, uh, which does uh, extend the scope and does, I think, is responsive to your question 
uh, Artie, because it it re it recognizes formally for the first time that that the issues of the so-called occupation cannot be divorced from uh, the overall Israeli strategy uh, with respect to uh, expansionism and uh, the, com what I call the completion of the Zionist project. And uh, that's, in my mind, the interplay between this commission of inquiry and the recent outcome of the Israeli election really highlights that as the new uh, kind of core of the uh, current phase of confrontation. If I might stay with you on that, Richard, and on this subject, and we'll open it up for Michael and, and John as well. Were you a member of this Commission of Inquiry, the Pile Commission of Inquiry, of which you've just spoken, and had a broader mandate to address matters that go beyond the Green Line and back to 1947, what do you think you would prioritize? What should this Commission of Inquiry, in your respectful view, prioritize? Well, of course, that requires uh, an adequate answer would be a long one, but uh, let me uh, just uh, give it a very abbreviated response, it would require a proper contextualization of the whole evolving structure of uh, Jewish claims of supremacy in a non-Jewish society. I mean, the, the, uh, to make uh, the Palestinians strangers in their own homeland or actually discriminated strangers in their own homeland seems to me to be the foundational flaw of the Zionist project. And uh, to bring that into the open suggests the incompatibility uh, between uh, the way Israel has evolved and minimal respect for human rights standards and compliance <laughs> with international law. So I think it's that issue of recontextualizing this is not a matter of occupation, but of uh, uh, dispossession of a people from their own country and the failure to work toward a uh, diplomacy that redresses that uh, fundamental injustice. Uh, and going to you, Michael, uh, and connected to this, you had mentioned earlier with reference to Francesca Albanese's uh, first report on settler colonialism, that <clears throat> looking forward, the settler colonialism issue uh, needs to be better articulated, if you like. Um, uh, what your view on the geographical limitations of the 67 sure. mandate and what do you think the Commission of Inquiry, uh, the Pile Commission of Inquiry should be focused on? Sure. You know, the, it, it's, getting, it's getting harder and harder with respect to the question of, uh, of Israel and Palestine to, to say democracy here and occupation or apartheid there. Um, you know, the if Israel uh, uh, deems that there's no such thing anymore as a 1967 border, then why should the Palestinians uh, be boxed into talking only about what happened in 1967, when it's obvious the roots of, uh, of their uh, exile, uh, their disbursement and the shattering of their society, you know, occurred in 1948 uh, with, uh, uh, based on um, uh, issues that occurred beginning 30 years before then. So I'm, my sense is, is that if the Commission of Inquiry has set the, set the precedent of wanting to look at the, the question of Palestine and all its aspects between the river and the sea, that the mandate of the special rapporteur uh, given to it by the, gen, gen, the uh, Human Rights Council should also be expanded as well. Um, and I mean, the, the end result of all of this thinking is, you know, a two-state solution uh, to this issue that is the cornerstone now for the last 20 to 25 years of, uh, of the international community, particularly the global north, 
um, is now a, an illusionary prospect, uh, given the uh, intense uh, efforts at de facto annexation and apartheid in the occupied Palestinian territory. We now have to be thinking of a way uh, forward for the 14 million, as I said earlier, uh, Israeli Jews and Palestinian Arabs who are now demographically equal to each other between the river and the sea, as well as considering the question of the uh, Palestinian uh, refugees uh, in the diaspora. Um, because there's no, in the end of the day, there's no future that's going to be secure, stable, and prosperous for both Israeli Jews and Palestinian Arabs, unless it's built on the question, uh, on, the, on the solid bedrock of equality and, uh, and human rights and, uh, and dignity. Um, without those elements in any final settlement, um, any thought that there's going to be a durable and just solution is, is going to be simply uh, illusionary with respect to that. So that to me has to be the animating lens through which we look at where we're headed with uh, in, in trying to resolve this conflict. Thank you very much, Michael. John, any words on these, any thoughts on these ideas here? Well, tonight we have not mentioned an institution which uh, a few years ago was seen as fundamental in the promotion of human rights in uh, Palestine, and that is the International Criminal Court. And it's important to ask the question, why has this gone off the agenda of the international community? <laughs> and, and the reason, unfortunately, is that the uh, present prosecutor of the International Criminal Court has made it very clear that he is not particularly concerned uh, about uh, Palestine. And I think one must bear in mind that this is an important institution. The uh, State of Palestine has referred several important international crimes to the International Criminal Court, uh, ranging from the construction of settlements to the establishment of an apartheid state, and of course to the killing of civilians in Gaza. And uh, the uh, International Criminal Court has found that it does have jurisdiction uh, to consider these matters, but the uh, prison prosecutor of the International Criminal Court uh, seems largely unconcerned about what is happening in Palestine. And I, I think it's important not to lose uh, sight of this institution. One must uh, bring pressure on the International Criminal Court to act. And of course, in fairness to the prosecutor, just let me say that the reason that uh, he is not prepared to take this issue seriously is because the uh, uh, Western states such as the United States, uh, United Kingdom, uh, Australia, Canada, France, Germany, the Netherlands are not particularly keen on uh, his pursuing a prosecution. In fact, they have opposed it. And uh, this, this is a matter which requires serious attention. Thank you very much, John, uh, for that reminder. I, I regret to say that looking at the clock, we have, oh, about six or seven minutes left before we must close. And so I would like to take this opportunity to offer you three an opportunity to offer final comments, perhaps touching on going back to your book, why the book matters um, uh, in, in your view and why readers should, should pick it up and, and consider it. Uh, why don't we begin with you, John, and then we'll work uh, through uh, to Richard and then Michael. Yes, well, I think the, the book matters in that it draws attention to many of the uh, principal issues uh, facing uh, Palestine, and it does indicate the extent to which uh, international human rights law and international humanitarian law uh, are violated with the impunity uh, by Israel, and it also uh, underscores the uh, failure of the uh, international community to uh, secure accountability for uh, these international wrongs and international crimes. And uh, I think that in this respect, the uh, book is, is valuable because it does provide an overview of the uh, issues that need to be uh, addressed. Thank you, John. Richard. Uh, well, I, I think uh, John just gave an admirable uh, and concise uh, 
sense of why the book is important substantively, I'd say it's also important uh, in uh, dramatizing this interaction between the effort to scrutinize Israel's behavior uh, and Israel's effort to evade that process and the uh, uh, the really irresponsible and uh, defamatory use of anti-Semitism as a means of deflecting attention to the messengers rather than the message and justifying in some sense uh, obscuring the reality by denying access and failing to cooperate uh, with the uh, special rapporteurs, which is a, a international legal obligation of members of the UN. So that the, this failure, which I think is uh, likely to be accentuated by the extreme government that has just come into power in Israel and uh, puts even greater pressure on the UN to try to uh, maximize the role it has of securing uh, justice uh, for the oppressed Palestinian peoples who have uh, lacked the implementation of their rights over a shockingly long period of time. And it is, as uh, the quotation from Kofi Annan suggests, an open wound in the reputation of the UN as a uh, global body politic serving the well-being of humanity. Well said, Richard. Michael, final words. Sure. I, I I said earlier in in this on this panel that um, you know the achievement of self determination, a genuine self determination of the Palestinians is not going to come, you know, mainly through international law. But on the other hand, it's important to know that uh, the tools of international law are um, uh, are important arrows in the quiver of the regional and international human rights movement. Uh, you know, most reports that we all of us, you know, certainly the three rap uh, former rapporteurs, but also people on this uh, pa panel call as well in the audience, will know that the reports by regional and international human rights organizations regularly cite international law as the legitimization of their analysis of, uh, of affirming uh, the question of Palestine, affirming Palestinian rights, and negating uh, Israeli claims for the right to annex, the right to build settlements, uh, the right to, I, I suppose, scatter uh, Palestinian society. So for all of those reasons, I mean, I think that's why, you know, the work that John and Richard and modestly myself uh, have contributed to through our reports as special rapporteurs, as all three of us lawyers uh, with regards to this, is with that in mind, that we're trying to find a creative way of marrying uh, the, the precepts of international law, the very best of international law, with what civil society uh, can do with these with these tools in order to push their respective governments and the UN uh, towards meaningfully uh, moving the uh, the uh, the arrow on the uh, on the arc uh, closer and closer towards justice in Palestine. And if I can just say this last last point, Artie, with respect to this, I uh, you know we all know the. Uh, the the very famous statement by Martin Luther King Jr. who said that the arc of you know arc of history bends uh, is long but it bends towards justice. What we often forget is the addendum that was added to that by his, one of his lieutenants, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, who said uh, um, he says yes you know the arc of justice bends towards the arc of history bends towards justice, but you've got to make it bend, and it doesn't it doesn't do it by itself. So it's a tool we've got to keep in mind for all of us in terms of pushing this forward uh, with respect to the move towards social justice. Thank you so very much, Michael. You, 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 you end us all on a very positive note. Uh, whenever I discuss international law and the question of Palestine, either with my students 
or indeed with members of the general public, there's always a strand of people who, for good reason, look cynically upon the United Nations and upon uh, what, uh, for the reasons that, that Richard had mentioned earlier, uh, the primacy of geopolitics. But there is a tension between the normative force of international law and the tools to be used and that politics. And it's how you uh, meander through uh, the international system and this tension through the use of international law that will define how successful you are in the end. Um, thank you very much for that. I, I, on behalf of the Institute for Palestine Studies, on behalf of myself, really, I should like to thank you, uh, John and Richard, for providing the highest examples of what it means to be engaged scholars, international lawyers as well, in the world, striving to speak truth to power and blazing trails for all of us to follow um, with a view to creating a more just and, and secure uh, world, in, including in Palestine as elsewhere. I encourage all persons who are watching this to go out and get a copy of this book to support Playgrounds for Palestine and to support the struggle for human rights in Palestine. I'd like to thank again the, the Institute for Palestine Studies and uh, wish you all well uh, uh, for days ahead. Take good care.